Welcome back uh, to this uh, series that we're creating for EuroPCR. And I've got with me uh, Buster Howes. Now, Buster has been a Royal Marine for over 30 years and retired as a general, so amazing uh, leadership credentials. And so I think uh, this session is going to be about uh, leadership and resilience in the team. So, so Buster, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Iqbal. Uh, well, I, I wanted to start by saying that uh, I know that um, those to whom my messages are aimed are very experienced in managing emergency. You know, your your daily work is 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 characterised by often by emergency. But I I think I would contend that this pandemic, this global crisis, is is different in in so many ways, um, not least because of the prevailing uncertainty of it for those operating in the NHS, is that they're not only dealing with crisis, but they are routinely now dealing with their own vulnerability to that crisis. In other words, you know, make massive decisions about life and death routinely, but the risk of you becoming a statistic is a big big complicating factor so your people are dealing with change risk fear fatigue anxiety and leadership is the golden ingredient which can keep all this in manageable bounds you know there will be no time in the history of the NHS, I would suggest, where strong, charismatic, inspirational leadership is so important. Leadership, mm. not, ma not management. There's a reasonable way of defining trust, which is that it's a combination of, <clears throat> well, four things, three positive, one negative. Credibility, which is about competence, is about professional ability, proficiency can you do what you say you will do do you know your stuff can you walk the walk it's about reliability do you do what you say you will do are you a person of your word always always you write stuff down so you don't forget but when you say you'll do it you do it oh. and and intimacy and intimacy is a, particularly in the sort of Anglo-Saxon culture, is a complicated thing. Um, and perhaps even more complicated since the, in many respects, entirely reasonable activism of Me Too. You have to be seen to be believed. You do have to walk the walk. You have to be a human being. And there is a, there is a probably a, a time-honoured, as I understand it, culture in the NHS, that a good doctor is actually quite objective and abstracted because you're dealing with an environment which is emotionally incredibly taxing, life and death. The only way you can navigate that environment without eroding your own resilience is to be quite detached. There's a diagram um, which was produced by a man called Eric Byrne, who was a Canadian psychiatrist, called the Byrne Model. And in just in the very straightforward terms of how we, we converse, tries to explain how people respond and how rapport between individuals is built. And we have things like called conversational enablers, which in Britain is the weather. And Iqbal, you and I could talk for half an hour about the weather and neither of us would have communicated anything, but we'd have filled the space. And it's only when you start showing something of yourself, you start describing the fact that you have children and that you care about them. And, you know, you start talking about values and beliefs, the things that we tend not to talk about in a working environment. You build that rapport. And as importantly, you legitimize confidence in the people who work for you. And this is about making sure that information flows well through, through what can be the baffles of hierarchy. You need to know what's happening in this strange, confused world. And the only way you'll do that is by building 
the confidence, trust and rapport for people to speak their minds and to say what's happening. Mm. So that's really important. Now, you know, when I finished as a general, there were 17 ranks between me and a Royal Marines rifleman. And so, you know, that it can be quite a trick to work out how you, you do that. And the tendency is to say too much. In order to build a dialogue, you lean too far across the table and overwhelm the person that you're looking to communicate with. And it isn't a dialogue. And the thing about, you know, you're born with two ears and one mouth. And to use them in that ratio and to allow the silence to speak. You know, if you're anxious about silence, you'll always fill it. Well, don't. Because sometimes it takes people a bit of time to come up with what it is they need to say. So um, you, were, you were mentioning to me, Buster, that uh, recently you came across an example in the um, NHS setting where that uh, intimacy seemed to be absent, that that sort of uh, hand on the shoulder did not occur. Can you tell us about that? There was a really interesting question posed to me recently, which is that how do you physically distance people without socially isolating them? Because of all the mental problems that then arise. And one of the challenges for the NHS staff is that they are all physically isolated from one another and the example that uh, I would point to which was in a hospital in a COVID environment and a young female consultant had clearly had a brutal shift she was exhausted both physically and emotionally and she was there it was in the staff room and there were a group of perhaps you know 10 people and she, she started to cry and clearly overwhelmed. And she sort of turned away from the camera. It was a, it was a documentary news thing and gathered herself. And then her, the, the, the man in charge of the shift, who was clearly concerned and her colleague sort of spoke with her and said, are you okay? And she sort of, you could see her physically sort of grasping herself and bracing up. She took a huge deep breath and said, yes, I'm OK, and then walked out of the door. Now, she manifestly wasn't. You need to find ways either through language or somehow to, to show this compassion, to connect in a way that in that example, that young woman, she, you know, she walked away still with her difficulties unresolved. So can I suggest an example? Again, we, we've thought about this at Imperial. And uh, one of our consultants happens to be a lady, uh, but one of our consultants, uh, Dr. Pabari, is tasked with actually following up all of those types of incident, giving that person a phone call uh, or a chat and saying, look, you know, away from that 10 purple in the staff room, uh, is there anything else that we can do? How are you feeling? And again, as you say, given, given that time and space. So, uh, the, the final point you were making was about the fact that there was one downside uh, in terms of how you assess uh, trust in a leader. So we'd covered the credibility, resilience and intimacy, but we haven't got to what the downside was. What's, the, what's, the, what's at the bottom end of the equation? So the fourth factor is the zinger, if you like, and that is perception. I say that again, perception of self-interest. So when you're leading whatever size group, it could just be one, it could be the entire hospital. You can't, you can't help everybody all the time, but all your decisions are about, you know, helping as many people as possible to do the job that they're required to do. This is not about you. This is not about some springboard or platform for self-aggrandizement. This is about unfailingly looking at the needs priorities, requirements of the people that as a consultant or as a senior manager or director in the NHS, you serve. They don't serve you. So, so I think uh, if we summarise then, then the uh, part of the success of uh, this crisis of protecting uh, the individual, the team and the organisation, if we summarise like that, is to have the right leadership and you've clearly described what leadership actually looks like. It's about being able to communicate and not being a regimental general, as you were, but a human figure uh, 
about being able to generate that trust so people would work with you and for you. And that involved you being credible or anyone being credible, being reliable, having the human touch to be able to be intimate when you needed to be intimate, and actually also not being seen as uh, having some sort of self-interest uh, as the center of it all to be working selflessly. And uh, again, if I translate it back to Imperial, uh, we seem to have a very good leadership group who've really stepped up to the plate and I think are, are sharing all of those qualities. It's not in any one individual because we've shared it all out, but the group as a leader, I think, is also a very useful organization. It's, a, it's, a, it's an organism, organism in itself if you have a group that can be the leader, especially when there are so many different facets to talk about today. So I think in an army, you do need a head man. In an institution like the NHS or a, a department, I think it's a good time. And we've seen it. Some of our younger consultants have really come to the fore and developed into flourishing creatures uh, just because of this crisis. And uh, it, it's been fantastic to watch. Can I have one just after Bernard? I've been doing work in the last couple of months where you have this battle rhythm of, of, of meetings and you go through your agenda. And then quite often action minutes are sent out to confirm what has been agreed. And what I've tried to do is encourage the leaders and directors to then have a piece on the end of that daily summary, which is surprising. You know, I've had them send um, pictures, links, things which cross the kind of bureaucratic divide such that, you know, Iqbal Malik stands up as a human being rather than just the, or, or primarily the director of X or Y. That's a, that's a point very well made. So Buster, thanks again for sparing the time to join us. And hopefully it's proved useful to our audience who will be a wide variety of healthcare professionals that uh, may not have come across uh, Buster's unique set of skills. So thank you very much.